Und ein schönes Green. Uh, let me know when you guys see my screen, my my slides. It's all okay, Rajit? Not yet, Basil. Not yet. We are still waiting. Okay, how is it now? We are still waiting, Basil. Let's give it a minute. Yeah. Okay. So let me reshare. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Oh. Okay, all good. Uh, just a quick five minutes introduction about the group first. Uh, uh, welcome to your user group, so which is an AMD Dynamics 65 Phenox team. Uh, and special thanks for all the volunteers, speakers, and attendees who have joined us today uh, out of their busy schedule, giving up their family time for the community. So really appreciate and thank you so much. So before uh, we jump into the original sessions, we got few new people joining us today. So it's all about uh, know your group, what we are planning to do and what we are aim to. So we have posted the same uh, agenda, same thing on same thing on our uh, LinkedIn group and LinkedIn company page there. So basically, our intention is just to gather specifically Phenox professionals from AMZ region uh, to focus on Dynamics Finance and Operations ERP modules of uh, Dynamics 65 ecosystem. So we will be focusing mainly on the Finance and Operations platform. Uh, if, we, if we see at later stages, definitely we will touch all the integration or integration stuff, which includes Power Platform, and one of the topics which we are going to discuss about Azure ecosystem. So we what what we want to have users at one single place so they can connect uh, with the wider platform professionals and learn about releases and keep themselves up to date. We also aim to build FinOps community into the ANZ region. Uh, that will help users to grow their knowledge. We're primarily talking about users in this group who can network and experience all aspects of finance and operations and supply chain. We want everyone to get involved into this journey where we can build a strong community across ANZ region and then we can help each other. What we are aiming here if you write any blog if you if you tweet if you link if you share any articles about finance and operations and supply chain you can feel free to use these uh, hashtags so that it actually uh, represents your own community which is ANC dynamic 65 finops team the rest of the two i have just pasted here you may guys you may also have been using these ones already so the whole idea is try to get involved a lot of people from different uh, cities, different countries, which include Australia and New Zealand. How to join you and follow your group? We have this particular a uh, company page, which you can easily search onto the LinkedIn ANZ Dynamic 65 Phenox team. And at the end of the presentation, we will also be uploading these presentations uh, and all the links and on our YouTube channel. So please, please feel free to join those uh, groups from the uh, mentioned links here. You can also follow us on our Twitter account here. All our videos are going to be uploaded onto our dedicated uh, YouTube channel. Please do subscribe and share all your video, all the videos with the others. 
We also have an uh, upcoming session where Zishan is going to talk about how to close your books in record time using fin financial period clo close workspace. That is the hot topic nowadays. That's the upcoming feature uh, where Zishan actually wanted to talk about this feature. It's happening on to the 31st of October, the very last Saturday of this month. At the same time, so, uh, keep up to date from our uh, LinkedIn invites, and uh, we will be sharing more into more about what's going to discuss uh, from the agenda point of view. So, with this one, I'll hand over to Awa, and he is going to talk about uh, finance and operations uh, with the Azure ecosystem integration stuff. Thanks, Faisal. Let me start by sharing my screen. Sure. I hope everyone can see my screen now. So uh, welcome yep. to this webinar about integrating finance and operations with third party systems. So in the next 30 minutes, we will discuss a couple of real world case studies displaying two robust reliable and scalable integration solutions designed with the help of applications available in Microsoft Azure. Of the two integration solutions presented in this session, one would be outbound from finance and ops and the other would be inbound to finance and ops. And we will try and dissect all the salient moving parts involved in the two integration solutions and how we can apply similar principles to our integrations. So without further ado, let's jump right into our first case study, which is an integration done for my current client, which is an Australia based business called NHP Electrical Engineering. Some of you might be familiar with NHP as some of you in the audience are working for NHP as well. But um, uh, NHP is one of the largest importer and distributor of electrical products in Australia and New Zealand. NHP has a supply chain extending to Europe, US and China and utilizes Microsoft Dynamics Finance and Operations to manage the supply chain and logistics involved with the business. So in our first case study, we are going to talk about how the advanced shipping notice or the ASN was integrated in NHP. This is an inbound integration from a vendor's ERP to the client's ERP which is finance and operations in this case. Before we start talking about the details of the integration solution, a brief word regarding the ASN itself. Simply put, an ASN is a notification of pending deliveries similar to a packing list. It is usually sent in an electronic format and is a common EDI document. It benefits the logistics stream tremendously by reducing receiving cost and improving accuracy. So with the groundwork now laid for the first case study, uh, let's start to look into the nitty gritty of the integration components involved in the solution. So a brief disclaimer before we begin is that I've taken a few liberties in this case studies is in the in the sense that I have combined uh, multiple um, cases into one to present a more consolidated form of study. Uh, but the principles are the same that we are going to discuss. So with that, uh, so this is a high level overview of the integration solution put in place to consume the vendor supplied advanced shipping notice in the client's implementation of finance and ops. Since an ASN is a text file in a certain format, it is being uploaded by the vendors to either their FTP server or enqueued to an instance of Azure Service Bus. We have a logic app listening to each of these locations and they are triggered as soon as a file is uploaded to the FTP or a message is enqueued to the Service Bus. These logic apps then make a restful API call to a custom web service exposed from the finance and ops, which accepts the contents of the ASN file as a parameter. 
and the logic app authenticates itself with finance and ops via Active Directory OAuth. And this service operation just spawns a reliable asynchronous process, which in finance and ops mean a runtime batch task which parses and acts upon the specified ASN file content. As all this activity is designed to occur autonomously behind the scene, there is a custom screen created as well, which um, it's created in finance and ops, it, and it logs all the all the activity, which enables a user to monitor whatever action has occurred for an ASN in finance and ops, and possibly take remedial actions if required. So with this and an overall understanding of all the different parts involved in the in this integration, let's take a deeper dive into some of the important individual components of the solution. The first and foremost of the components involved in this case study are logic apps. Azure Logic Apps is a cloud service that helps you schedule and automate business processes when you need to integrate systems and services across organizations. Logic Apps simplify how you design and build scalable solutions for system integration and B2B communication, whether that be in the cloud or on premises or even both. For example, we have used Logic Apps in this case to move uploaded ASN files from an SFTP server to Fin and Ops. To build enterprise integration solutions with Logic Apps, you can choose from a growing gallery with hundreds of ready to use connectors. We have used three main connectors in this case, which are FTP, Azure Service Bus and an HTTP connector to make the service call to finance and ops. Connectors provide triggers and actions for creating logic apps that securely access and process data in real time. Every logic app workflow starts with a trigger which fires when a specific event happens which in this case is when a new ASN file is uploaded to the FTP server or a new message is enqueued to the Azure service bus. Each time that the trigger fires, the Logic Apps engine creates a Logic App instance that runs the actions in the workflow. So let me zoom it up a bit so that we can see the actual flow in action, especially if anyone is doing this on a smaller screen. So this logic app starts with an SFTP trigger with the built-in criteria when a file is added. If the trigger detects an event that matches this criteria, the trigger fires and runs the workflow's actions. Here the actions include the declaration of a couple of variables to get the file name and status. Then we check a condition that the file name contains a certain expected value which determines for us that it's an ASN file. If the condition is true, the workflow then makes a REST call to our custom service operation exposed from finance and ops. If the REST call succeeds, the workflow proceeds to move the ASN file to an archive directory and deletes it from the original directory on the SFTP server. So the same, so this is done to make sure that the same file is not picked up again in the next iteration of the logic app. I haven't got a screenshot of the other logic app, uh, which listens to new ASN messages arriving in an Azure service bus instance, but uh, you can imagine it's very similar to the structure of this logic, logic app. You can build your logic apps visually with the logic apps designer, which is available in the Azure portal through your browser and also in Visual Studio. For more custom logic apps, you can create or edit logic app definitions in JSON by working in the code view editor. So logic apps use consumption based pricing, which means there is no cost associated with creating and deploying your logic app. A cost is only incurred once your once your logic app runs. 
you can create your logic apps as as your resource manager templates so that you can automate logic app deployment across multiple environments and regions. Since logic apps are represented by JSON files, they can be checked into source control and we can use DevOps release pipeline to do continuous integration and deployment as well. The second component of interest in this integration case study is Azure Service Bus. Simply put, Microsoft Azure Service Bus is a fully managed message broker and it offers a reliable and secure platform for asynchronous transfer of data. Data is transferred between different applications and services using messages. And um, a message is in binary format, and in this case, it contains just text, in this case of ASN. A service bus can decouple applications and services, like it decoupled the vendor's ERP system from our receiving logic app in this case. It improved the reliability and scalability of our integration as the vendor and our systems don't have to be online at the same time. In the service bus, ASN messages are sent to and received from queues use store messages until our logic app receives and processes them. Messages in queues are ordered and timestamped on arrival. Once a message is accepted, the message is held safely in redundant storage. And messages are delivered in pull mode, which means only delivering messages when requested. The service bus connector that we have used in our logic app monitors when messages are received in the queue and marks them as complete once read. All the service bus triggers are long polling triggers. Uh, this means that when the trigger fires, the trigger processes all the messages and then waits 30 seconds for more messages to appear in the queue. If no messages appear in 30 seconds, the trigger run is skipped. Otherwise, the trigger continues reading messages until the queue is empty. Another nifty little detail that I want to touch upon in this scenario is about the custom service exposed from finance and ops and consumed by the logic apps. As the developers among us know, when a custom service is written under a service group, the service group is always deployed on two endpoints a SOAP endpoint and a JSON endpoint. So our logic app in this case consume the JSON endpoint of the service. Once the logic app consumes the operation and passes the contents of an ASN file to the operation, all the legwork of parsing and acting upon that ASN is performed within finance and ops. As an ASN file can contain hundreds of items in the case of a large shipment, this process of parsing the file and creating warehouse loads or other records can take a fair bit of time to complete in finance and ops. Hence, it was important to execute this process in an asynchronous manner to prevent issues like timeout of REST API calls from logic apps. For this reason, reliable asynchronous execution has been used in this case as it is the recommended mechanism for executing lengthy calls. Reliable asynchronous operations use the batch server session for execution. Uh, this fires off a runtime batch task in which the actual heavy lifting of a process is done, whereas the calling process completes right away and returns a success status to the logic app. This approach has the added benefit of ensuring the process executes only when the batch server has capacity. Running operations in this mode is equivalent to running them on the batch server with the additional behavior that the jobs are automatically deleted after they are completed, irrespective of whether they were successfully completed or not. However, the job history is persisted in the system so we can track the execution of reliable asynchronous calls by tracking the associated batch execution history. 
So this brings us to the conclusion of our first case study. Uh, before we embark upon our second real world scenario, are there any questions about the concepts we have discussed so far or any other question about why things were done in a certain way? I got one question about here. Sure, Faisal. Uh, why did we go with logic app? What is oh. the why? Like, uh, if we talk about, if we talk with the customers, uh, how should we go and say, okay, logic app is going to be a lifesaver for you, and it's going to be less less cost effective for you. So basically, uh, logic apps are a very good way of trying to glue your two systems together. So in this case, uh, the the issue that we had was that we needed a mechanism to read the ASN files that the customer is uh, the, the client, the vendor is uploading to their FTP server. So um, I mean, one way to do that would be to use any any third party system to route the, those files onto us. So one way or the other, we would need a sort of a routing mechanism to consume to have those files being consumed in finance and ops. Another way would be to write custom logic in finance and ops itself, but the, then you would be very tightly coupling your finance and ops implementation with that vendors, FTP details, and all that. So do you need you need not have all such details in finance and ops because that would leave a much larger uh, footprint on finance and ops. You would have yep. to have have all the vendors, FTP details, and the service bus and any other mechanism that you want to integrate finance and ops with in finance and ops. So rather than do that you should leave all such details out of finance and ops and have a sort of a middleware where you can have your your files and your messages being routed to you. So that kind of decoupled finance and ops. So that's a one obvious benefit of logic apps. Besides the fact that they are scalable, there is no cost associated with creating and deploying your logic app. You only incur a cost once your logic app runs. So the, the, these are the benefits, so scalability and reliability. So this solution has been up and running for quite some time for us, and we haven't had any real issues with it. So you talked about uh, the timeout issue at some stage. Yep. So there was a, that was what, one of the reasons you, you choose to go with the logic apps. So what is the timeout limit here? Right, so basically a uh, timeout was not caused by a logic app. So uh, the issue with the timeout was that um, the logic app has to make a REST API call or and even if we didn't have logic app, any other middleware there, it would be consuming a service operation that we have exposed in finance and ops. And it would be passing the content of the ASN file to that service operation. And once we have got that service, opera the service operation has got that information, it need to parse that big ASN file and these files can be very big in some cases in the case of large shipments and to act upon that information. So it would have to create pallets and loads and all the license plates and those sort of details. So all these that work can be very time consuming. So that's are why. You doing, so are you, sorry, are, you, are you handling all your error messaging into Logic App itself? No, nah, so we have deliberately kept our logic app very lean here. So logic app uh, has only one purpose. In this case, if we talk about this logic app, it has only one purpose that it listens to new files uh, on the F being uploaded on the FTP server and it just passes those files onward to finance and ops. So there is a no deliberately no business logic being written in logic app. So that in future, if we were to replace it with any other routing mechanism, we would be able to do that because the best place for all those ASN specific logic would be in finance and ops. And that's yes. where that logic has been written because finance and ops knows best how to handle an ASN and the logic app has been kept oblivious to all those implementation details. Are you passing JSON format or? Yeah, yeah, so uh, the service operation that we have exposed in finance and ops, uh, we are consuming the JSON endpoint for that service operation. So why JSON over SOAP here? Uh, because uh, JSON is uh, pretty concise and th there are pros and cons in using both. So um, 
there wouldn't be any uh, severe performance issues if we were to go with SOAP. So yep. we just had to pick pick one, I guess, in this case. So we decided to go with JSON uh, because it's much more concise. And uh, while we were developing this, it, it was very easy for us to test that service operation through Postman as well. We, we could create our own um, ASN yep. messages in Postman. So it, it was just the conciseness of the JSON format that probably tip the scale in, in favor of JSON. And uh, it, it's also a bit of a historical reason as well that in NHP, uh, we have written a lot of APIs and a lot of service operations. So pre pretty much all of them, uh, we are consuming the JSON endpoint for that. So we historically, we tend to go with JSON. So that's why we have give, given that way, uh, gone that way in this case as well. Perfect, thank you. No worries. Rachid got one question here. Let's go ahead, Rachid. Yeah, thank you, Fazal. Uh, thanks, Abab. Uh, that's really nice presentation. Just one question. So you are showing that vendors, uh, you are reading uh, from vendors FTP. So was this created for any specific vendor? Because in real time, you may have multiple vendors and their format of ASN may vary. So did you guys created one logic app per vendor? Uh, that's a very good question, Rajit. So at the moment, uh, NHP has a very big supplier who who already who we, we have already integrated with for DMI. So they all, they, we already create purchase orders in finance and ops uh, because we have DMI implementation with them. So, and they have already got an NFTP server there. So we have decided that they'll just upload their ASN files to the same FTP server that we are already listening to and just create a new logic app to process those ASN files. But in future, let's say we have to implement a new vendor, then it would be if if it's still um, an FTP way that we are going down, then we probably have to either use their FTP server or expose one of our own. So one way or the other, they would they should be able to pass their text file, which is an ASN file is just a text file at the most basic level. So they need to pass that file on to us one way or the other. So it, it would be either through service bust or FTP, or there could be some other mechanisms that we can uh, come up with once the time is there. And it need not be uh, a different logic app for a different vendor, because essentially the logic app is doing, all it's doing is reading that file and passing it on to finance and ops. So there is no vendor specific logic written in the logic app itself. So it could be one logic app that we we might decide to service multiple vendors. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Abab. Yep. You're welcome. So if there are no further questions, let's jump off to our second case study. So while we just saw a real world example of an inbound integration to finance and ops, our second case study for today is an outbound integration from finance and ops. So whenever um, sales or transfer or, or even production orders are released to a warehouse in finance and ops, uh, this process creates corresponding work orders in the system. These work orders represent the actual work to be done in the warehouse in order to fulfill those orders and can be considered as picking list for the staff on the actual warehouse floor. The client in this case needed to integrate their work orders in finance and ops with their third party software solution deployed in their warehouse. This third party software solution drives the actual picking in their warehouse through a conveyor belt that goes around the entire warehouse. You can see in the diagram on the screen that we have three logic apps running on a recurrence of three minutes with the help of a schedule based trigger. These logic apps then use a get records action to fetch the target work orders via uh, data uh, via um, data entity from finance and ops. These logic apps then compute the order priority with the help of logic written in an Azure function and compose a file with all the work orders included in that iteration. This file is then uploaded to the client's FTP server, which is accessible to the destination system. 
as in all file based integrations, uh, we have to ensure the destination does not start reading a file before the writer has finished writing it. And a time tested way of ensuring that is to write the file with a temporary file extension first and renaming the file to a final extension once the file has been uploaded completely. This is done with the help of another logic app that just triggers whenever a new file is uploaded to the FTP and renames the file to the desired file extension, which is then available to be read by the destination system. Although not shown in this diagram, once the logic app has read all the work orders available for that iteration, the logic app goes back in finance and ops and flags those orders as read so as not to pick the same orders again in the next iteration. One question that might arise in, in a few minds at this point is why we use three logic apps, one each for sales, transfer and production orders, whereas we could have got the three type of work orders in a single logic app as well. This was done for performance reasons as a single logic app running every three minutes would have a lot more orders to write in a file if it were to consider three types of orders rather than one. As you can't write the second line in a file before you have written the first line, the, fi the file has to be composed sequentially in this case. So it follows naturally that the more lines that have to be written in a file, the longer it would take to compose that file. And in a busy warehouse, as we can imagine, this would introduce quite a bit of latency, which is undesirable. So to speed things up a bit, the logic apps workload has been divided into three distinct apps, which would all run in parallel with each logic app just curing its specific type of orders. As before, with an overall understanding of all the different parts involved in the integration, Let's take a deeper dive into an important component of the solution. We have already talked about logic apps in the previous case study, so we will discuss Azure function as they are a new component in this case. Azure functions allow you to run small pieces of code without worrying about application infrastructure. With Azure functions, the cloud infrastructure provides all the servers you need to keep your application running at scale. And our function in this case was written in C sharp, but you can write your functions in Java or other supported languages as well. There are quite a few languages that the Azure function support. In the scenario that we are considering at the moment, the Azure function was written to compute the priority of a work order. This priority just determines the urgency with which this order is handled while being fulfilled by the warehouse personnel. In our case, the business has defined certain rules which dictate the priority of an order. So for instance, a sales order, which is not an intercompany order and has a delivery reason of urgent specified is given a higher priority than an order where a delivery reason of urgent is not specified. So we had two ways of incorporating such business logic. One method would be to write this calculation in a postload method of the data entity itself. Since this logic is very specific to the to this integration, writing this specific logic in a generic data entity is not ideal. A better place for such logic would be in an Azure function, which is specifically written for this integration and can be tightly coupled to it. This keeps the data entity loosely coupled and generic enough to be used for other integrations as well. Azure functions allow you to develop serverless applications on Microsoft Azure. Serverless here does not mean there is no server. It simply means that you as a developer need not worry about the provision and maintenance of a server. This frees you up to focus on providing more business value, whereas the infrastructure related requirements are taken care of for you. Another key feature of Azure functions is you pay only for the time spent running your code. 
once your function is live, instances of the Azure functions host are dynamically added and removed based on the demand. Your function scales automatically and you're charged for compute resources only when your functions are running. And billing uh, in this case is based on a number on, on the number of executions and the time it took for each execution and the memory it used. So just one more point that I would like to make here, going back to the integration architecture diagram. Uh, one optimization we could have done here rather than a logic app running on a recurrence and trying to check whether there is there any work orders available to be read. We could have finance and ops trigger a logic app as soon as there is work for it. This would eliminate the wasteful cycles that are always present in a regular polling strategy. But it was decided to go with a pull based integration approach rather than a push based one in this case due to its simplicity. But a push based integration setup is certainly possible with finance and ops and logic apps. So this brings us to a conclusion of this presentation and the floor is now open for any questions. Silence is golden. Go ahead. Go ahead. I got one question. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Abab, again. Uh, so just one question. Can you give some idea on uh, what was the volume uh, or you know frequency for these integrations at which these were running? Yeah, so uh, these uh, these three logic apps they were running on a schedule based trigger, so they were running every three minutes. So day day or night, they run every three minutes. And this is the sort of um, a, a yeah. sweet spot that we have worked with with the client. So this sort of is a trade off. So it's it doesn't hold up work too much. And it's not uh, more frequent than what we need because the more frequent we run the logic apps, the more costly it's going to be for us. So three minutes is what we have uh, arrived at with experience, and it seemed to suit the client in this case. And in terms of data, can you give us a high level number like how much data were you pulling out of Dynamics? Was it in it in hundreds or thousands uh, in terms of the orders which are getting exported? It would be uh, definitely uh, uh, around thousands. Uh, so it's a, it's a very busy distribution center that NHP has got here in in Melbourne, and it services the entire nation here. So uh, it it do it do get quite busy throughout the day. So I can't recall the exact numbers at the top of my head of at the moment, but it would definitely be th in the thousands of work orders every day that we move through that distribution center. So the logic apps have Ooh. been yeah. holding up pretty well. So it, this setup has been up and running for a, the better part of two years now. And uh, uh, besides some small problems, we haven't had major issues with this approach. Cool. Thanks, uh, Abab. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, Abhi got one question here. Go ahead, Abhi. Thanks, Faisal. Uh, thanks, Abab. Nice presentation. I have a question around the third party warehouse system. So your diagram explains about how the data is going into the third party system. But uh, I'm just keen on how the work completion from the that way uh, that application is coming back into F1 and communicating back. Uh, the reason why I ask is I have a question around that renaming the file. Once you get the work orders, temporarily you are renaming that file to send it to that third party system then how is the data flowing back into FO? Correct, that's a very good question, Navi. So basically you have two questions. One is around um, what comes back from the third party system, and the other is what we are exactly we are doing here by renaming the file that we sent to the system. So I'll answer the first question first, which is um, what we get back from the third party system. So we definitely get a picking information back from them. So remember, we have work orders in the warehouse management system sitting here. So once the work is picked by in, in the warehouse, the third party warehouse system 
sends us a picking confirmation our way. So I haven't captured that in this diagram because it would make this diagram a bit hard to read, but there is another integration inbound to finance and ops. So a file is being generated from the third party system, which contains a, the, uh, all the, the what, whatever quantity that they have picked on the warehouse along with the work order number. And it's also a file that they their system uploads to an FTP server and we have another logic app listening to that FTP server that as soon as a picking confirmation file is being uploaded to that FTP server, that logic app fires and consumes a custom service operation in finance and ops with the contents of that picking confirmation. And based upon the type of work order that, that is being confirmed here, so for instance, if it's a sales, or sales order, that custom service operation that we have written here, it goes ahead and posts the packing list and closes the work order and takes similar actions for transfer and production orders as well. So that there is another inbound integration that we had to make for the picking confirmation side of things. And regarding your second question, Avi, that uh, what we are doing here with this rename logic app. So uh, like I mentioned before, in, in any file based system, you have to have some mechanism to ensure that your reader, in this case, your third party warehouse system does not start reading a file while you, you are actually in the process of transferring it over to the FTP server. So in our case, since it's a picking file, sorry, in our case, it's a picking file. So it could be a very large file in some case. So it could have a lot of work orders in, in it. So what it, it might take some time for the file to be completely uploaded to the FTP server. To, so to make sure that the third party system does not get ahead of itself and start reading the file while you are in the process of writing it, uh, we first write the file with, let's say, a dot draft extension. And the third party warehouse system is only hooked to look for files with an extension, let's say, dot txt. So it won't even look at any file that has an, an extension of dot draft. So uh, the file would have an extension of draft uh, while it's being written. Once it's completely written, then th this logic app would trigger because this logic app is, is listening for any text file there. So once the file is there, this logic app would fire and it would only rename that file's extension from draft to text. And once that's done, then that file is visible for the third party virus system to be read. So it does include um, include a minute of latency in the process because uh, even though you might have finished writing the file, but it's still in in a dot draft format, dot draft extension, so it won't be read by the third party system uh, until this logic app renames it to dot txt. But that's a latency that we have to have in in a file based system to make sure that in every case you own your system only reads the file once you have finished writing it. I hope that answers your question, Avi. Yep, thank you. Uh, one question, sorry, Pawan, you go first. Pawan got one question here. Yeah, thanks, Avi. So uh, my uh, my question is basically, uh, uh, in this in this diagram only if uh, uh, what about the exception handling if something goes wrong uh, during the processing of sales order transfer order then uh, how we are dealing with it is it that uh, we are leveraging the resubmit of this uh, logic apps or is there any unified view from there we are doing something on this so basically uh, a few things can go wrong one could be that you have a uh, so you have released some sales orders and uh, didn't mean to do that. Let me bring the diagram up again. So you have released some sales orders and uh, it has created work, but uh, the work is not going out to the FTP server. So the work is not being available in the warehouse. So in that case, uh, so I haven't shown here in this diagram, but once a logic app reads a work order, and it successfully uploads it to the FTP server, it then goes back in finance and ops and flags that order as being read. So that uh, after the next three minutes when the logic app runs next, it does not pick up the same work order again. So as long as that work order is not flagged in finance and ops, it would continue to be visible to the logic app and it would continue to attempt it to transfer across. 
So we haven't had much dramas in the logic app failing to read or failing to write. But if it were to happen, then that that order would not be flagged. So there won't be any case of having a work order sitting in the system and and, and a logic app not trying to send it across. Because once it has sent it across, it would come back in and flag the order in the system. Does okay. that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. So Thank you. We, can, sorry, we will take a last question, Prajeev, then we will move to the next question. Uh, we are also planning an, an advance and a second or third session for the same case studies. Uh, so we can have more, more insight or make more deep knowledge about these two topics. They are very vast topics. So Prajeev, please go ahead and unmute your yeah, um, question. Yeah, I, I don't have more of a question, but I just have uh, kind of a information. Uh, so, Awab, uh, thanks for this uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, so, we also had a similar <clears throat> integration developed earlier in my project. So, what we did is uh, within the FTP, but in our cases, it was Azure Blob Storage. We created three different uh, folders, uh, in processing, completed, and archived, and error. So the external system uh, only reads from the completed folder. So we didn't do the re any renaming to the file. So, but uh, this was approach also I liked, like uh, renaming it uh, to dot text or something. So uh, your third party system only reads from the folder structure uh, with the, uh, from the completed uh, folder. Yeah, correct. We, uh, we could have yeah. gone that way as well, but yeah. uh, it, it's a similar approach in principle that you are making sure that you only upload a file to the destination folder once you have ensured that it's completely written. Yeah. So yeah, it's a sort of a similar principle involved there as well, which which you have to cater in any file based integrations, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, thank you, Awa. With this one, a great presentation. Uh, I would like to hand over to 